This is Fifth, and you're watching the XJW Fifth YouTube channel. I'm very honored to have on the program today uh, Dr. Yanya Lalich. Uh, she is a sociologist, uh, retired professor of sociology, and she's authored uh, several books regarding cults and extremism. Uh, she was also even the consulting producer on the program on A&E uh, before the Leah Remini episode uh, that had to do with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there was that series on A&E entitled Cults and Extreme Beliefs, and it was a nine uh, episode series. And there was one that had to do with Jehovah's Witnesses uh, that featured Barbara Anderson and Romy Maple, and she was the consulting producer uh, on that program as well. Dr. Lalich, thank you so much for taking the opportunity uh, to speak with us and um, enlightening us all with your with your insight. Thank you, Cliff. I'm really happy to be here. Great. I'm very happy as well. Very excited to have you on the show. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your background as it pertains to um, your expertise on, on cults and maybe even uh, specifically Jehovah's Witnesses? Sure. Uh, well, it all started back in the 70s when I myself got recruited into a cult uh, that I was in for about 10 and a half years. Uh, it was a political cult. You know, we were going to make the revolution. <laughs> and, um, you know, get rid of sexism, racism, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when I got out, I was about mm, 41 years old and had to start life all over and started researching basically to understand what had happened to me. Um, and eventually I went to graduate school, got my PhD. I started attending conferences that related to, to the cult subject um, and then, you know, got the job as a professor, was doing research and writing books. And so over the years, I've basically studied and researched and learned about hundreds and hundreds of cults and realizing that they might look very different on the outside, but inside they're, they're all structured and pretty much run the same way and using the same kinds of manipulative techniques, um, I've had, you know, a fair amount of contact with former Jehovah's Witnesses and so have been able to study that group. Uh, a number of years ago, I wrote an article um, based on research about uh, gay ex-Jehovah Witnesses and, and what their lives were like. Um, and then, as you mentioned, you know, most recently did the uh, show with A&E on Jehovah's Witnesses and at that time got to meet Barbara Anderson and Romy. Uh, which was, you know, really great. Romy's amazing and Barbara Anderson is just awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's obviously Jehovah's Witnesses is one of those groups that I think a lot of people don't think about as a cult. You know, they just think, oh, these are these nice little ladies who come knocking on my door. And I say, you know, until these shows have aired and some of the lawsuits recently, um, you know, people in general don't think about the dangers of Jehovah's Witness and, and the way that organization is run. That's very true. Uh, that's something I've noticed also in speaking with different people, trying to kind of bring awareness uh, to this subject. Most people will say something like, well, my neighbor is a Jehovah's Witness and they're very nice people. Right. But, yeah. you know, the idea of belonging to a cult obviously goes far beyond just being a nice person. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's something that we're going to explore uh, a little bit later as well. So. As far as you joining that cult, you mentioned that you were a part of uh, the cult, the uh, Democratic Workers Party, yeah. and um, that was a cult that was uh, headed by, by a woman named Marlene Dixon, mm -hmm. right? And what's interesting, as I kind of you know looked up a little bit about your history and your background, is that um, one thing that you were mentioning is that the stereotype of someone who joins a cult is, mm -hmm. you know, you're just very gullible, you're... Maybe you don't have a formal education to be able mm -hmm. to spot these th different things. You you don't know how to think or different exactly. things like that. I remember you even mentioned people would ask you, how could you be so stupid to mm -hmm. ever join a cult? And I, I feel like a lot of us have heard similar sentiments. What was uh, your situation leading up to your getting recruited in, into the cult? Had you not had any education or what was your what was your oh, circumstances? No. I had already um, graduated from college. I went to the University of Wisconsin, which is an excellent school. I graduated with honors. Uh, I then got a Fulbright fellowship to um, do some research in France, uh, and those fellowships are very difficult to get. Um, so that was in the 60s. Uh, so I was, uh, I had traveled. I'd been to many different countries. I considered myself a tough, smart person. 
Um, I had, you know, sort of made my way around the world. Um, when I came back from France, I lived in New York and worked, you know, very high powered jobs. Um, but the, the situation, basically when people get into cults, it's, it's generally because of a, a, a situation, what I call a situation of vulnerability, like something that's going on in your life that makes you open to try something. Um, and this, of course, excludes all those people who are born and raised in a cult. That's, you know, obviously they didn't choose that. So for me, I had been living in Europe for about four and a half years, and I came back to the States, um, and it was the mid-70s, and um, I wanted to be a writer, and I was living in San Francisco, and, you know, I was kind of a hippie and kind of left-leaning in my politics, and I so I was new in town and I was making new friends and that was my vulnerability right and so I met a woman who uh, I would have coffee with she was a friend of a roommate uh, we'd have coffee we'd have these great political discussions um, and I had always been interested in social justice and social change and so she eventually in, invited me to join a study group and I thought oh well that's a great thing I'll meet some new people you know I'll learn stuff it'll be great and then after a few weeks in this study group, um, they met with me again and asked me if I wanted to join the organization that was behind the study group. Um, I didn't know at the time that there was such a thing, but uh, the, the way a lot of these uh, groups work is they have what we call front groups, right? Study groups, Bible study, whatever it might be, right? Yoga classes, you name it. Um, and they're used to kind of soften you up to the message. Um, so that then when they approach you, when the recruiters approach you about going the next step, you've already been partially ingrained with that belief system and thinking, oh, yes, that would be wonderful, right? So I joined. Most of my few friends that I had at the time were also joining, so that seemed okay. And boom, that it went from there, and it just got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's how I got in. And I think myself and many other people – basically belie the stereotype that it's stupid, crazy people who get involved in cults. Cults don't want stupid, crazy people. They look for the best and the brightest. They want people who are going to work for the cult, right? Who are going to raise money or who have good contacts. Um, if, you're, if you're mentally ill or you're troubled or you're sick, they're going to get rid of you, right? They're not there to take care of you. You're there to take care of the cult leader and the cult. Exactly. And I think that's so important to, to bring light to um, the fact that this whole stigma about the type of people who are susceptible to joining cults is very misinformed. Well, I was going to say about the stigma. I mean, the other the other side of that is the stigma keeps people from seeking help right, because right. they don't want to let anyone know. You know, so mm -hmm. people often just, you know, as we say, crawl back into the woodwork. You know, they, they aren't going to go around saying, hey, I was in a cult. I need help. Do you know a good therapist or do you know a support group? Because they, they know that they'll be, you know, looked at funny like, oh, you were in a cult. There must be something wrong with you. And so it mm -hmm. really prevents people from getting help. And it prevents our society from setting up resources for former cult members. That's very true. I know a lot of us who have left, uh, well, I can just speak for the Jehovah's Witness organization, uh, myself included, have found it somewhat challenging to try to find someone who's actually an expert and who actually has, you know, devoted years of study to this particular subject. Um, do you think that that's something that is because of the awareness that is now being brought, you know, a little bit more with these shows that we're kind of talking about in these books and these exposés? Are you optimistic that uh, in the near future, there will be more options for people who are coming out uh, to be able to speak with certain professionals uh, on this subject? You know, I don't know that I can say I'm optimistic. Um, you know, it's difficult. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I have seen only minuscule changes in the numbers of resources. I mean, mostly it's people who've been in cults mm -hmm. who end up going on to school and becoming therapists or becoming, like myself, becoming an academic. Um, I I would so love to be able to go to places like um, the conferences that psychologists have or social workers or even EMTs, you know, all of the helping professionals, they really need to be educated about the symptoms of someone being in a cult and the symptoms of someone who has left a cult. Uh, it's part of the reason I've written my books is to, you know, be able to hopefully get those 
to helping professionals. They can see the kinds of things that that former cult members go through or the kinds of things that cult members themselves have experienced, the trauma. Uh, so hopefully it'll, you know, hopefully it'll get better, but I think it's going to take a, a, a lot of hard work. I mean, when we think about domestic violence, right, it, it, so many women suffered from that silently and had nowhere to go. And it took about 25 years for a society to finally understand that this was a societal problem. It was not an individual problem. It took that long to, you know, for cities to send up shel- set, set up shelters, to train police officers how to respond to those calls, et cetera. Um, that's happening now with human trafficking. Um, and, and that's a great thing because there's many similarities between cults and human trafficking, the way people are bonded. But uh, f- for the issue of cults, I, th- I think it's going to take a long time. And, and, and that's why I encourage people to speak out, you know, uh, to, to um, do whatever they can, to go to their legislators, to, 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 you know, if they see a therapist, give the therapist a book that helps explain it. Right. I think what you're doing is fantastic. I mean, social media today is helping a lot of this. There's so many, like you have a YouTube channel or a mm-hmm. Facebook page or a, you know, a, what are those things called? Uh, I, uh, podcasts. Podcast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry. Yes. Podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And that, and that is really helping, you know, spread the word. And so I, you shouldn't discount what you're doing by any means. You're, 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 you're doing a great thing and a great service. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure anyone else who is uh, part of the uh, XJW activism uh, community will also appreciate those sentiments. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, talking a little bit about the process of recruitment, you you touched on it with the uh, Democratic Workers Party. But I'm sure, you know, obviously you're familiar with how Jehovah's Witnesses work as far as that is concerned. Can you comment on your observations of that recruitment process? And again, we'll deal with children who were born into it a little bit later, but uh, mm-hmm. talking about you know getting people from outside and bringing them in. And mm-hmm. what are the similarities between what you observe with Jehovah's Witnesses and what's just common in cults in general? Well, it seems that you know the the, the main way the witnesses recruit is is through their door to door proselytizing. Um, they, you know, there's also ones who stand on the corner and try to hand out the watchtower. I, I, I don't think that's very successful. Um, I don't think so either. (laughs) It's what, it's what we call stranger recruitment. Um, and stranger recruitment is, is much more difficult to pull off, Mm -hmm. but by going door to door and, um, meeting people face to face and having quiet conversations with them. Um, the, the, um, once they can get the foot in the door, once they get invited in, right, as we know, they're going to keep coming back. They're going to carry on these conversations. They're going to, you know, discuss the watchtower. They're going to, you know, give the person readings. I mean, I had a good friend whose husband, uh, was retired. And so he was home a lot while she was working. She was a professor friend of mine and he got so close to being recruited. You know, he was a smart guy. He was a geologist, Mm. you know super intelligent and man, he was absolutely taken by these people who would come and visit him and she would often come home and they'd be sitting there in the living room and she, you know, so then she contacted me. She's like, how am I going to get these people out of my house? Right. Um, so the, the, the ones who are very good at sort of making that social connection with someone and starting those conversations, I mean, that's how recruitment works, whether it's, you know, whether it's to a meditation group or a political group like mine or a therapy, whatever, whatever. There's so many consequences. But it takes that social contact. It takes setting up that first emotional bond Mm -hmm. and and making the person feel like you're really listening to them and you really have some answers that are perhaps settling something that's been troubling their mind. And, And by being consistent and being persistent and keep going back and keep like building that relationship. It's all about relationships. I mean, that's what recruitment is. And and uh, not everyone's good at that, but the ones who are good at it um, are, are going to succeed. I think that's, that's absolutely true. And um, as you were talking about that, I was just thinking, again, growing up as a, as a Jehovah's Witness and even being an adult as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're always told that you're always supposed to be in that mode, right? So children at school, they'll say school is your territory, your Mm -hmm. teachers, your, your, uh, your classmates, uh, at work, right? You're not supposed Mm -hmm. to have 
uh, outside, a whole lot of outside communication with workmates or, you know, develop strong bonds. But that's part of your territory. If you can, you get at every opportunity, you try to uh, give that message in whatever way possible or your family members who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. So I think what you're saying is very clearly uh, demonstrated within the Jehovah's Witness organization and the admonishment that they receive from from the leadership. Absolutely. I mean, in the group that I was in, uh, actually, at one point, I was in charge of recruitment. I was the, the lead recruitment officer. And every one of our group meetings, they, they were called branches. Every branch had a recruitment officer. And so my job was to train them. And people had to turn in, all the members every week had to turn in a recruitment report where they wrote up who they were targeting and how it was succeeding. And then the recruitment officer would go over that with them. Well, try this with that person. Try mm -hmm. this with that person. And you couldn't see anybody unless you were saying that you were recruiting them. Like I had a really good friend that I used to want to see. And I would, I actually would lie. And I would write on my recruitment for it. Um, you know, I'm going to go over and try to recruit Alice, you know, and, and I'd go over and I'd have dinner with my friends and their kids. And it was like a night off, you know, and of course I never, I never intended to recruit them. Mm -hmm. uh, was my sneaky thing that I was doing. Um, but every minute, every minute, you had to be thinking about that, and, and besides all your other work or tasks that you may have. Um, so I don't know if JWs have actually have you write in written reports. They um, absolutely do. Uh -huh. yes. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. Uh -huh. And so it's very targeted, very concerted. Right. Let's now talk a little bit about a, uh, a child that is born into and raised uh, in an organization, um, feel free to, you know, tie it directly to Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, you know, also speak about just cults in general. What is the process of a child's indoctrination um, when compared to, you know, that of an adult? Well, you know, to me, this is the most tragic part of cults. Um, and, and just I'm going to make a pitch here for my book because you may have listeners who were born in or we know many people who were, but my latest book uh, was based on interviews with 65 individuals who were born or raised in a cult from, from a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, and some of, the, some of the people I interviewed were Jehovah's Witnesses or ex-Jehovah Witnesses. Um, and the book is called Escaping Utopia, Growing Up in a Cult, Getting Out and Starting Over. And it came out last year. Well, it came out in 2017 now. Um, it's a small book. It's very readable. It's not, it's not super academic, but it is based on research. Um, and it sort of talks about what kids go through, the kind of trauma that they experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what's really difficult for the kids, unlike those of us who, who joined as adults, is that it's the only world you know, right? It's, it's, it, it's your entire surroundings. It's your, you know, and, he, and especially for Jehovah's Witness kids, now, a lot of cults homeschool, and so those kids have very little contact with the outside world. With witnesses who actually send their kids to public schools um, is, a, is kind of a double-edged sword, because as you know, as a kid, you're not allowed to make any friends. Uh, you're not allowed to participate in any of the celebrations or activities in school. You know, if there's a birthday party, you have to go sit in the principal's office. So immediately you're set out as some kind of weirdo, right? It sets you apart from the other kids, you know, like what's wrong with Cliff? Why can't he celebrate my birthday? Right. And you can't participate in any after school activities, right? You've got to come right home and go out with your mom banging on doors or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it sets up this kind of um, alienation, you know, kind of a double, double alienation for the kids. Um, because you're, you're not allowed to have any sort of social contact. Yet on the other hand, you are seeing that there is this outside world that does these things, you know, so mm -hmm. it may start to plant seeds like, why don't we celebrate birthdays? Why don't we, you know, celebrate Christmas? We say we believe in Christ, you know, whatever. So, <clears throat> but for the kids, I think <clears throat> it's so severe um, and, and if there's physical punishment, of course, that's always sheltered and hidden. Um, the teachers aren't going to find out about it as they might with other kids. And I think the worst part of the witnesses <clears throat> is the rampant sexual abuse of the children, uh, which we're finding out more and more about. And, and certainly that's something Barbara Anderson can speak to. 
um, the years and years and years of cover-ups and the millions of dollars that have been paid out to silence people. <coughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, allergy season. And, um, you know, we kind of say, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses is like pedophile heaven, right? Um, because the, the, they get away with so much in that organization. You know, they find out and they just send somebody to another congregation and they don't tell the congregation this person has a history, right? Um, so it's similar in a sense to the Catholic Church that covered up for years. And look how long it took for that to come out. Um, and and um, the witnesses, I think, is even harder because pe people aren't, there isn't the support for speaking out as, as there is once the Catholic Church thing kind of hit the news and hit the public. Um, so it, it's, it's really awful for the kids. It's, it's really like a 24 hour indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And when, when people leave, when, when those who grew up in the cult leave the cult, it's that much harder to integrate into what mainstream society, whatever we want to call it, right? Because you don't have any experience with it. So again, everything seems weird and different. Um, whereas as an adult, like when I left my group, I had had 30 years of life before I joined the group. So even though I forgot about it a lot, I, when I got out, I was able to look up old friends, right? I was able to remember that I went to college. I mm -hmm. you know, had that background to rely on. I had those resources. I knew enough to eventually get into therapy. Um, whereas someone who grows up in a cult, it's so difficult and there's so many, um, so many troubling situations, so many suicides, you know, and, and witnesses aren't the only group. Many groups are, are keeping long lists of, of the kids coming out who are committing suicide and it's just tragic. And it, and it's one thing that as a society, we really need to get a handle on. It's a public health issue. Um, and it's part of why I do the work I do. It's just so important to, to get people to understand, um, you know, that this isn't just some cute little religion. You know, this is a dangerous place and it's a dangerous place for children. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that sentiment that it's a, it's a public health uh, issue. The effect that it has on a child's brain, as you kind of, you know, alluded to, you know, it, it creates this situation where there there aren't any other op there's there's really no concept of a something outside of this. Exactly. You know, exactly. I know for me that's not something that even crossed my mind as a child, right. and even as a teenager, it took took me a while to even like imagine a situation where it was okay to not be one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I wouldn't just you know just burst into flames or something. Exactly. You exactly. Know. And that's the terror that's implanted. I mean, it's part of the indoctrination. I think, you know, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you've seen and I've seen, you know, the, those awful videos they show mm -hmm. of Armageddon and, you know, the, the, the birds eating the dead bodies and the horror and the fire. And, you know, that, that these are shown to little children, mm -hmm. you know, just Im implants that kind of terror, you know. So you think if you leave, you know you're giving up your one possibility for salvation. And as you say, you know, you get to, you're at that point where you can't even imagine a life outside of the organization. And that, to me, that's the sort of the epitome of, if we want to use the word brainwashing, which, which is not a word I like to use because it's so controversial, but, but basically that's what happens. And even in, again, in my cult, with it, which I didn't grow up in, I, I could not, the door was there. I could not imagine walking out that door. I thought I would die. I absolutely couldn't imagine walking out that door. I was so enmeshed in the group. And, and that's what in my, uh, one of my other books and, and this, this framework that I use, it's what I call the bounded reality. You're in this closed reality. You're in what, what I call cults, self-sealing groups. The group is closed in on itself. And for children, that's just an impossible situation. Um, and and it, it makes it so desperate. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that about the, uh, the bounded reality. That was something before we came on that I was uh, talking to you about. I know as a Jehovah's Witness, if anyone ever told me like, oh, you can't, they make all your decisions or they tell you, you know, what to watch and what not to watch. And, you know, you're kind of thinking, well, well, that's not true. They don't say watch this movie, but don't watch this movie per se, right? Or they, you know, you have, you have freedom in, in your mind, you do have freedom to do certain, certain things, but bounded choice, right? It's in, it's all within the constraints of what is allowed, which is not, you know, is very narrow. 
And that's exactly. something that I think is difficult for um, for people to, to kind of uh, understand. But again, I was fascinated by that theory. Could you expound upon that a little bit? Sure. Um, so a bounded choice, which also there's a book by that name. If people are interested, I'll do another little plug. Okay. Um, but basically the way I see it is that cults are these self-sealing systems and they, they're made up of four broad components, right? It's the belief system. It's the, the authoritarian charismatic leader. It's what I call the systems of control, all the control mechanisms And then what I call the systems of influence, all the more subtle influences like the peer pressure and things like that, right? Those four things come together and and create this this bounded reality, this closed world. And, And you're right there in the middle of it, right? And so when people think about like, well, why didn't I leave? Well, of course you didn't leave. You were enveloped in this huge structural system, this social system that completely contained you and constrained you. So yes, you had this, you know, you had so-called free will, um, but it's really an illusion of choice because when you're presented with options, you know exactly the decision that you have to make in order to stay in the good graces of the group or the leader or stay on that path to salvation, right? So yeah, they might not tell you what kind of car to buy. <laughs> you know, So yeah, you have free will and <laughs> want to buy a Toyota or a Honda, right? But if you want to send your kid to college, oh, that's something else again, right? Because you had me look at that guy. What was his name, that yeah, guy? Anthony he, Morris, uh, Morris. Yeah, yes, from the governing from, body. Mm-hmm. Right. He makes it very clear. He doesn't come right out and say, don't do it. But he has so many threats behind it and so much blame placed on the parents if they allow their kids to go to higher education, Right that of course you're not going to do that. Or if you do it, you're going to suffer terribly, right? So this idea of bounded choice, I think, um, to me, it was kind of like the lights went off. Like, oh, my God, this helps explain why people do the, the, the things that, to those of us on the outside, seem crazy, right? Mm-hmm. Why do people let their children die, right? Why do people let their children be abused, you know? Why do couples separate, whatever it might be? It's because of this 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 altered reality, this closed reality mm-hmm. that essentially alters your free will. Yes, you have free will. No one's holding a gun to your head, but your free will is altered so that it's in it's in conjunction with the will of the group and the will of the leader, and in this case, the governing body. So true. And I was going to ask you if you had a chance to to look at that. Many of you who are watching are going to be already kind of familiar with that, but. Uh, I'm really happy you had a chance to to look at that and uh, you know share your your thoughts on it. Um, another thing that I want to wanted to touch on um, from what I read was this idea that you had that uh, for so many years, right? How long were you in in that uh, cult? Ten and a half years. Ten and a half years, a substantial amount of time. For so many years, you carried out the will of the uh, of the cult and of the cult leader, and you treated people a certain way that now you would view as possibly shameful or something that you would, you know, something that you would really regret. And I thought mm-hmm. that was that was a very good point because as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, right? It's like so, someone like me who's being shunned by virtually everyone I've known. It's sad, right? And it's it's terrible and it's depressing. But the reality of it is I did that to a lot of people, you know, cousins, aunts, uh, people that used to be that used to be my best friends. I was contributing to their isolation um, Mm -hmm. and their feeling just completely cut off and abandoned by people. And I thought that that was a great point, um, you know, that that you mentioned. I'm sure many that are watching can relate to that as well. You're you're ashamed or, you know, there's many elders who have conducted these judicial committees that get people kicked out. And Mm -hmm. I've had some of them on my channel and they're heartbroken about that, you know, especially as they've seen some of the effects that have happened, you know, later. Would you be would you be able to speak a a little bit to that and um, maybe even what what sort of healthy thoughts that those of us who have done that in the past, but have realized the error Mm -hmm. of our ways, so to speak, what what it is that we can kind of realize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, two of the. uh, after effects that that are so prominent in former cult members are guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. Um, And and most of that has to do with what we did while we were in the cult. 
Um, I was a true believer. I was always in top leadership. I expelled people. I, I put people on. We had what was called a discipline and control board, and I sat on that board, and I punished, had people have various punishments, uh, put people under house arrest, um, demoted people, mm. ridiculed people in front of the entire group, you know, whatever. Um, and so when I got out, I was just like, oh, my God, you know, who, who am I? How did I become that person? Right. Um, and it took, you know, it took a lot of therapy and a lot of, you know, actually going back to people and apologizing and saying, I, you know, I know it probably doesn't make it better, but I'm really sorry. You know, I, I did what I thought was the right thing to do at the time, but I really hurt you. And I'm sorry. And some people forgave me and some people didn't and still don't. Um, but. It, it, it helped me get through that process. Um, and, and understanding that, you know, it, yes, we all have responsibility for what we do, but on some level, it's not your fault, right? You were indoctrinated and trained to behave that way, right? Um, you, you didn't have the capacity at that time to say no, to resist it. Uh, eventually you did and, and got out, which is great. And, and uh, some of this is in my other book <laughs> called Take Back Your Life, uh, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships. I have a lot of exercises in there to help people. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that helped me was to kind of do a timeline uh, of what position I was in at a different, different points in time, what were the campaigns, the organization's various public campaigns going on at the time, uh, which helped me understand why I did the things I did, you know, who were my roommates at the time. So doing that timeline was very helpful because it helped me to see the larger context that I was in, you know, that I wasn't just some mean person hurting people, but I was part of a much bigger social entity that was hurting people, right? Yes. And, and Luckily, I eventually had the sense to get out. Uh, so I think for, for people to try to uh, get through that, that hard motion around that stuff is to, um, is to face it head on, you know, to, to get into therapy if you have the means to do that, to, to read some of these books about recovery and about trauma, um, and, and to, um, you know, be honest with yourself. Like, don't run away from it. But also don't don't let it control your life, right? right. It was something it was something you did during a certain period of time. You regret it, you know. You renounce it. Um, you deserve to have a life now because of what you experienced, and and hopefully those you hurt will understand. Um, and you know the the flip side of this is is the um, the, the the pain of of shunning. Um, <clears throat> You know, to me, shunning is one of the hallmarks of a cult when a group shuns. You know, I always say the difference between a good religion and a bad religion is if you leave a good religion, nobody cares. <laughs> and, and they'll right. still befriend you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but shunning is, is such, a, is such a, 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 an extreme practice. And, and my group did it as well. We, we called it, uh, we expelled people. And we called it, if, if you were expelled with prejudice, that meant that no one could ever talk to you again. If they saw you on the street, we had to walk right past you and pretend you didn't exist. You were essentially dead to us. Uh, so I understand very well what that is uh, and how that hurts people. Um, and I think because the witnesses are so family-oriented and families are recruited, um, the pain for people to be shunned when they leave uh, and not know if their mother or father has just died or not be able to attend weddings or, you know, not have any kind of meaningful contact, if any contact at all. It's a terrible, terrible practice. Um, and, and, you know, I did it to others. Um, it's being done to me now by some of the people from my group, even though my group doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's, a um, it, you know, it's one of the practices that leads to the, the suicides that I talked about earlier. Um, and, and it really is, it, it, it impacts you every day if you're a person being shunned. Um, and, and again, it's something that, that needs to be dealt with so that it doesn't control your life. You know, they're the ones doing it. They're the ones in the wrong. It's right. not in you did. Right. I think that's very true. And, and just to kind of, uh, hone in on, on this, this point, <laughs> um, you know, we kind of approach the topic of, uh, shunning others from the from the perspective of someone 
who realizes that that was wrong now, right? And then tries to go back. Um, but I've spoke about, like, for example, in the uh, Leah Remini uh, special on Jehovah's Witnesses and in, in, in other occasions, I've spoken about, uh, I had a, a situation with my mother where, you know, she saw me from a distance and she just was staring at me and she started crying. Mm. So one thing that I started to realize, especially from that point forward is, what does it do to somebody, even if you're a believer in that moment and you don't realize this is wrong? My mother is looking at me and saying, but I love my son, mm-hmm. but I have to reject him because that's going to help him. And, you know, that uh, shows my loyalty to, loyalty to God. What, what does that do to a person that's, that's doing the shunning? Well, it, 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 it's a very stressful moment. Cognitive dissonance is, is a very stressful state of mind. Um, and, and it, it happens a lot while someone's in a cult, there are going to be so many occasions where reality doesn't match what you believe. I mean, that's essentially what cognitive dissonance is. I mean, you know, it can cause a lot of pain. I mean, obviously your mother crying shows that she still loves you and she has genuine human emotions about that. Now that can be a good thing that can eventually move her to think what's wrong here, right? I I know I love my son. Why am I being told I can't have any contact with him? It it may lead her to question more and more and more. I mean, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? That would be amazing, (laughs) yes. Uh, On the other hand, you know, she may say something to somebody and then she'll get turned in and then she'll be, you know, criticized in the next meeting or whatever. Um, But... one can only hope that that kind of distress will push the person to eventually, you know, make the right decision to to go with their genuine human feelings rather than the, the, the sort of, you know, evil stuff that the governing body is telling them to do. It really speaks to uh, the trauma that people experience while they're in these groups, right? It's not all hunky-dory. It's mm-hmm. not a happy experience. I mean, people, you know, it's this contradiction. People think they've found something, right? They found salvation. It's like, oh, they're supposed to be so happy. And yet it's probably the most miserable time of your life, <laughs> right? Um, because because of these contradictions, right? Um, and so, again, one can only hope that, you know, that that disconnect. You know, we always talk about... We, we have this shelf in the back of our head. And whenever we have doubts and hesitations, we can't express them. We can't voice them because we'll get in trouble, right? So mm-hmm. we stick back on this shelf. And one day this shelf is going to break. Like too many things are going to go on that shelf and it's going to break. Right. And hopefully that's going to let you be free mm-hmm. and get it. Um, so, yeah, it, all of it is so troubling, really. And, and, and the, for people to understand the kind of trauma that people experience as members of these groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's so important. Another thing I wanted to to cover with you is, well, let let me touch on this very briefly. There are some individuals who after leaving, I, you know, again, I can only speak on Jehovah's witnesses, right. Um, uh, Just based on, you know, conversations that I've had and things that I've observed that there are Mm -hmm. some people who just leave the religion and just say, you know, I don't need to really do any research or any type of soul searching. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Self-reflection. Or, exactly. Yeah. Self-reflection. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of move on. And what's interesting is, and of course, it's not a criticism to anybody who would do that. But what's interesting that I notice sometimes is that uh, a lot of those people still have these hangups. You know, when something happens in the world, they're like, oh, maybe... Maybe there was something to that or, you know, different things of that nature. Could, is, could, could you speak to just what your opinion is as far as what is generally the most beneficial course of action for someone uh, pertaining to, to, to what I'm describing as far as what, what you do when you exit? Um, mm-hmm. is, it, is it okay in some occasions to just say, okay, well, I'm, I'm done with it and I'm just not going to, I'm just going to move on and not deal with it? Well, you know, it's going to be different for every person, but I I think just uh, saying that, just saying I'm out, I'm done, I'm moving on, Mm -hmm. is a form of denial. And I think eventually that comes back to bite people. Like you said, there there are going to be 
um, <clears throat> issues that never get dealt with, that are hangovers from the cult. There, there are going to be triggers um, that don't get resolved. You know, triggers are things that remind you of the cult. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I think that's not the, the healthiest way to go. Obviously, like you said, some people do that, and, and I don't want to judge them. Right. I think it's, I, for me, I think the best thing is when you first get out, go someplace safe, try to find what I call a safe haven, whether that's other family or friends or whatever it might be. Um, and that's why I always tell people who have someone in a cult, like mm -hmm. always try to stay on the good side. Just always let them know that you're a safe haven, that they can come to you and you're not going to say, oh, you stupid person, you were in a cult. You're going to let them just chill out. Right. <laughs> Um, so in the beginning, it depend again depending on your on the person's experience in the cult and whether they were born in and what their jobs were, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> beginning, they may just need to rest. I know I was so exhausted. We we worked twenty hour days, seven days a week, year wow. after. Year. I was bloody exhausted, um, and so I just needed to sleep a lot in the beginning, even though I I had to also go to work, mm -hmm. but. Um, and then I think um, finding trusting people to talk to, um, getting some of the some of these books that have been written about cult recovery, about post traumatic stress disorder. Um, hopefully, finding a good counselor or a good therapist. Um, and if the and if that person doesn't know about cults, give them my book, Take Back Your Life, or whatever. Um, I think what's not a good thing is to become an activist right away. Um, people often have the tendency once they get out and realize what they've been and they want to go back and get everybody else out, right? Or they want to tell the world, they want to bring down the cult, whatever. It's not good to do that right away. You have to get yourself centered first. Otherwise, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. You're mm -hmm. going to do you're going to do things that don't make sense. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to alienate people, whatever. So I'm always of the mind that get focus on yourself first, get yourself better, heal yourself. And then if you want to help in some kind of activist way, either on the group you were in or other groups or whatever, fine. Mm -hmm. But first focus on your own healing. Um, and, and it's going to be a roller coaster. It's going to be ups and downs. Um, there's going to be moments when you feel great and there's going to be moments when you feel like, is this ever going to go away? And there are going to be moments when you don't have to deal with it, right? You can, you can put it aside and say, you know what? I've been reading these books. I've been talking about this. I've been going to support groups. I'm sick of it. I want to just take a break. Mm -hmm. And that's good, too, and take a break. And then, you know, six months later, you might want to focus on it again. Mm -hmm. so, so that path is different for everyone. But I, I think the important thing is to take on the challenge and, and to really look at how you got bamboozled you know, how, how you ended up living the life that you lived while in the cult mm -hmm. and, and what was the impact on you? What was the, the, the psychological and physical impact on you <clears throat> and try to take that apart? Absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. I, um, I've shared with a few people, I guess I've probably never said this, um, publicly, but for myself as an activist, right. It does, it can take a toll, right. It's kind of, there's a balance because there's a part of me that feels very empowered. And, you know, when I get a message from someone saying, hey, you know, the video was very helpful, your activism is very helpful, you feel great. Uh, but what, I, what I've told some people is that every time I do one of these interviews where I'm hearing someone's story, I take a bit of an emotional hit myself because it has so much in common with my own story. And, you know, I, I feel like for the in the long run, it's beneficial because it helps so many people. But, mm -hmm. you know, usually after that, I kind of just back off from everything and just give myself, you know, that's something I've had to learn, you yeah. know, over, over time. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I was able to learn that because it was, it was much more, it's still difficult, you know, at times, but, um, I think what you're saying is, is very important that that's a good reason as to why you may wa not want to jump into it. Um, and you know, you just have to be balanced and make sure you're taking care of yourself. Right. Exactly. How As long well. have you been out? So I've been out, I'm, I'm coming up on my three year anniversary um, oh. tomorrow. Um, I'm, oh. I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air, but we're recording this on April 20th. So my announcement that Clifford Henderson, the fifth is no longer one of Jehovah's witnesses was April 21st, 2016. Wow. So I'm coming up on three years. I would say you're doing really well. 
You know, I like as I say. Um, well, I thank you for for saying that. Um, you know, obviously, I have my as you can imagine, I have my you know moments. I have mm-hmm. you know a lot of lot of struggles trying to make sense of why I'm in the situation I'm in, and and you know things of that nature. But um, yes, it, it, there is something to be said about feeling like you're helping you know other people. It kind of it takes you out of that uh, mode of just feeling kind of helpless. Yeah, you know. And I think yeah. that helps a lot. Um, I, and I was going to say, just, you know, as, as you mentioned, as far as the activism and doing shortly after. So I say that my full awakening happened a couple of months after in June 2016. By, by April 21st, I was I was almost there, but hadn't done the research. Um, it was just, you know, thoughts in my own mind. And, you know, once I did the research, just the floodgates opened and I was like, oh, OK, yeah. so I was right the first time, you know, um, right. And then I made my first video in November. So that was like, you know, that was five months. That was relatively short. You know, that was really relatively short amount of time. And I did, if I'm being honest, I did experience, you know, what you're talking about. You know, if I could have done it again, would I have waited a little bit? You know, I don't know. But in either case, it's uh, it is something to be reckoned with. It's something to 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 realize the effect that mm-hmm. it can have on you, depending on at what stage you're at. So that that's something I think is a great point is important for people to, to uh, take into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. I think the other important thing is that um, if you were part of a group for any any amount of time, Mm -hmm. um, it's never going to go away. The feelings that may arise are 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 never going to go away. And again, that doesn't doesn't mean it dominates your life or controls your life, but it's it's like a bad marriage or anything else, right? This is something that deeply affected you, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I know for me, I mean, I've been out of my group now for, I don't know, 30 some years, I think I still have nightmares about the leader. Now, again, I'm talking about this stuff all the time, right? Sure. I mean, I have six interviews just this week, right? So it's like always there, but still, I still have nightmares. Um, I still have triggers, you know, something will remind me of the group, Um, I still have a hard time sitting in a circle because that's what we did. We sat in a circle Mm -hmm. and criticized each other. Right. Um, so, you know, these things, they're they're like scars, you know, and then every now and then the scar gets pinched because something happens. Now, obviously it's, it's not like, oh, I'll have one of these triggers and then I'll be destroyed for the rest of the day because I can say, oh yeah, that reminds me of Marlene Dixon's voice. Yeah, I'm glad she's dead, you know, and then. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, but people shouldn't, my point is people shouldn't put themselves down. If even years later, they're still experiencing certain things about, you know, of emotions related to the group. Right. Um, because it was, you know, probably one of the deepest things that's ever going to happen to you. And, and especially if there was trauma and there almost always is, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's going to be there. And the point is to learn how to handle it you know, or learn how to ignore it if that's the best thing to do. Absolutely. And as you said, it's different for each person, depending on a variety of factors, your level of involvement, you know, how old you were when you, you know, started hearing these things and, and things like mm-hmm. that. So that's, that's excellent insight. I really appreciate you uh, sharing that. Um, could you speak a little bit to, uh, let's say someone that is watching this, that is, you know, they're scared and rightfully so because there are some serious consequences for for w- walking out in whatever way people do it you know the way the organization is set up now there's there's usually not a clean way to you know to to get out where you kind of get out unscathed what 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 are the prospects for someone what is what do you what can a person realize or how can a person's life change for the better once they do finally make that decision and start to think for themselves. Why is it worth it, let's say, to walk Oh, out? why is it worth it? Wow, because there's a whole world out there that's been denied to you. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's worth it because you're going to be able to develop your own critical thinking. Uh, you're going to be able to decide who you want to be, not mm-hmm. what someone else wanted you to be. Right. Um, you're going to be able to educate yourself if you want to and go on to higher education, which you probably weren't allowed to do in the group. Um, you know, you're going to basically be able to enjoy the world. Now, obviously it's going to be scary because you've been ingrained with so many fearful things about what happens if you leave. But, um, 
I, I, you know, I know for me, when I got out, I felt like I was let out of prison, right? I was like, wow, you know, and, and just the littlest things were so important to me. I remember the first time I watched a football game on television and I'm a big Green Bay Packers fan because I grew up in Wisconsin, right? <laughs> I made a big bowl of popcorn and it was a Sunday afternoon and I sat there eating popcorn all by myself and watching a football game. Oh my God, I was happy as a clam. I mean, th just that stupid little thing, you know, was incredible. Mm -hmm. And then the first time I saw the Oscars, like we never had time to watch TV or do anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the Oscars were on. And again, I was home alone. I was watching the Oscars. It was the year that um, that movie about Mozart won. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was like 86 or 87. And I, the tears were just rolling down my face that I was doing this like totally normal thing of sitting home on a Sunday night and watching the Oscars, right? And and it's like those moments that really make it worthwhile. And these these little little things. Um, in my book, Escaping Utopia, <clears throat> one of the girls who who uh, young women who left a group called the Children of God, which was a terrible group. Uh, she talked about the first time she got to go grocery shopping. Hmm. And how how she there were like all these boxes of cereal and how she could could choose which one she wanted and then she fell in love with jam she had never had jam and she used to buy dozens of jars of jam and her roommate who had not been in the call at the time her roommate thought she was crazy because she was always buying these jars of jam right? <laughs> so I you know when when <laughs> when someone thinks of leaving you know and it seems scary there's also going to be these incredibly joyous little moments and it's those little moments that count that make life what it is absolutely um and that's I answered the question you I, I, you absolutely did i was you know as you as you're talking i'm kind of reflecting uh reflecting myself and just thinking about uh you know despite the challenges it really is a wonderful feeling on, on a lot of different levels just how your, your mind is able to expand and uh, you're able to, you know, you're no longer in that bounded reality, right? You can, you can kind of, the world is your oyster. It's, you know, it's a huge world and you can just, you could basically make of it what you, what you want. And right? you can say no to things. And exactly. You how to say no right. is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it doesn't make you a bad person, right? Exactly. It doesn't mean exactly. you're going to get destroyed or anything like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so. learning how to make decisions. I mean, even little decisions. I know, like when I first got out, people would say, oh, let's go to the movies. Mm -hmm. What movie do you want to see? And I'd say, oh, I don't know. You choose. You know, because I was so used to not making decisions, right? Yeah. So, you know, now I can decide. I can make a decision about what movie I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great learning process. That, that's an excellent point. And, um, Everything that you have said has been just very thought provoking and something that is, I'm sure, going to help many people to be able to uh, reflect, you know, wh whatever stage they're at. If they're watching these videos because they're doubting or if they have actually left and realized they have some work to do, you know, as far as um, self, maybe a degree of self, -develop self development and, you know, things of that nature. Um, it's just, you know, really amazing insight. And. I really want to express my gratitude to you, uh, Dr. Lalich, for for taking the time out um, to to speak with me. As I said, it's you know it's been a bit of a struggle trying to align our um, our schedules, but I really thank you for not not giving up and uh, you know being willing to take this time out. This is this is going to be something that's very powerful for so many. No, oh, well, great, that's wonderful, and I really appreciate you initially contacting me and and struggling through my schedule to. <laughs> finally find us a Saturday morning that we could do it. And um, my dog even has been well, re relatively well behaved. Well, that's so, great. Um, no, I, I, I really enjoy doing things like this. It's what, you know, it's what I, I always say, this is my way of turning a bad thing into a good thing. Like, right. this is what I feel I can give back to society after mm -hmm. my own dreadful experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to do this. I, I also, I just want to mention my website for your listeners sure. in, in case... Uh, anyone wants to go there and then through the website, people can send me messages if they wish. But the website is www.cultresearch.org. Pretty simple, cultresearch.org. Excellent. And I'll be sure to, to put it up in the video or, you know, in the description as well. So people can uh, can have access to that. 
thank you again, Dr. Lalish. And, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time out and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And carry on. Thank you.